Is it visible? Not yet. No? No. Ah, now it's visible. Yeah. So this is the pediatric potpourri. That uh, oh my, this is the this is the quiz. This is a quiz. Is that visible? Yeah. Okay, so this is the pediatric potpourri that we've been talking about. This uh, today it is uh, meningitis in an infant, the case discussion. And uh, for this, we start with today's uh, pediatric potpourri with the case presentation by Dr. Balasubramanian. Well, Dr. Balasubramanian requires no introduction as such because he's one of the pioneers, of one of the doins in pediatrics actually. He's, he's uh, the medical director and HOD of pediatrics at Kanchakamukodi Child Trust Hospital, Chennai, Donnery Pediatrics in Southern Railway, Headquarters Hospital, Chennai. There is an interest in infectious diseases, pulmonology, PG education, and OSCE training. He's got about 75 index publications, 90 index publications, and is a co author and a co in his books and chapters, an examiner of the MRCPCH UK. 32 years of teaching experience, and uh, he's done about 500 training sessions for pediatrics, pediatric PGs. And so that's why we have got him here for this particular topic. He He's done his MNMS, MAMS, FRCPCH, and FIAP. Uh, he's a distinguished DNB teacher, Lifetime Achievement Award from Tamil Nadu and Dr. MGR uh, Trophy. And he's a convener of the ACPIP 2018-19 and advisor 2020. Over to you, Dr. Palsman, for your. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, I'm sharing the details of a case we managed about uh, uh, three months back during the peak of uh, COVID-19. This was a 94-day-old uh, male infant who had a history of five days of fever with irritability and refusal to feed. Uh, this infant was taken to a pediatrician on day two with fever and crying. Cefixim was prescribed with the advice to follow up if symptoms persist beyond 48, next 48 to 72 hours. The fever did not come down, the crying continued. The mother on day five of illness noticed that the anterior fontanel was beginning to bulge. She noticed it right on day three and day four, day five increased. And uh, when we inquired into the history, the mother said there was some diarrhea about uh, 10 days prior to the onset of this fever, which subsided spontaneously. Can I have the next slide, Jason? So, what is your comment on a uh, pediatrician describing cefixim on a three month old on the first day of fever? Uh, see, giving cefixim to a two month old baby. I don't think I have ever had an indication to give uh, a cefixim to any three-month-old infant so far in my career uh, for day one of fever. See, if you look at the approach to an infant who's three months old who has fever for one day, we must remember fever in an infant less than three months when there is no focus, what we call it as fever without localizing signs, FWLS, it's a red flag. It's a red flag. Any recorded temperature more than, say, 38 or 38.5, particularly when it crosses 102 Fahrenheit, is definitely a red flag sign in a three-month-old. That is number one. Second point we must remember, why is this a red flag? Why should we raise the red flag? The reason why we should raise the red flag is because SBA, not State Bank of India, serious bacterial infections are very common in infants without focus, with, with, without infants with fever without focus or fever without localizing signs, whatever you call it as. And it is, it is estimated that at least 5% of 
fever without focus below the age of 3 months may have serious bacterial infection in some studies it has gone up to even 10% though viral infections are still the commonest cause of fever in this age group and if there is a serious bacterial infection you have no business to prescribe antibiotic to a serious bacterial infection without a label without diagnosis so prescribing cefixim to somebody with fever in a infant who is 3 months old is not standard practice and it should be discouraged so what are the situations in which you think uh, you give an antibiotic without a test in this country yeah basically you know outpatient practice most of us gs and me we all prescribe antibiotics mostly on empirical basis without investigations or we ask for investigations we start antibiotics pending results number 1 you know an infant say you have asked me a question below 1 year in infant below 1 year if a child has got dysentery bloody stools acute diarrhea it's an indication for antibiotic the reason rational being shigellosis is the commonest cause of dysentery once you find visible blood you don't do stool culture you don't do any test stool routine is waste you give antibiotic number 1 number 2 you have an infant who has got acute otitis media in dysentery we don't try to prove the organism you know it is certainly likely to be bacterial two in otitis media acute otitis media 9 month old infant fever crying you do an otoscopy you find evidence of otitis media red drum you know it's a clinical diagnosis and in a young infant you are going to prescribe antibiotics nobody is going to question you for not obtaining microbiological proof nobody is going to say you have to do beringotomy grow pneumococcus and then give antibiotic so if you think it is certainly a bacterial infection and you can't get evidence for it you give an antibiotic empirically number 2 three you have a child say for example a 10 months old infant fever and dysuria and you have asked for a urine routine test you think it's uti temperature 102 and the urine shows plenty of pus cells you know it is most likely to be uti it is rational if you prescribe an antibiotic after getting a culture done without waiting for results so you don't wait for 3 days for proof of uti if you have reasonably good diagnostic criteria clinically and with urine routine you are going to start four similar example young infant you have a infant with pneumonia the fever tachypnea most recommendations say if you have fever and tachypnea the diagnosis of pneumonia is clinical and no investigations are needed x ray is not needed routinely for garden variety pneumonia i will definitely consider antibiotic even as outpatient of course depending on the severity i may treat it as outpatient or inpatient last i have an infant say for 9 months old or 10 months old who has what looks like a viral infection say varicella and you shall in that age group the varicella is there varicella is a disease which doesn't cause much a fever whether it is a young child or an older child and varicella you have fever for more than 4 days or you have a child with measles in spite of the rash appearing the fever is still spiking tachypnea is there so a typical course of a what looks like a viral infection i would definitely give antibiotics last but not the least very rare in infants you have multiple pyderma you have a big abscess you have skin and soft tissue infection you may not do any investigations you may you are rational in prescribing cefadroxil or uh, 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 your cefalexin an antibiotic to cover mssa and i don't think i will do any test these are some of the examples in which i would consider giving antibiotic definitely cefixim 
is the last drug I would be giving to a three-month-old infant who's got just fever, and more so when there's irritability when I don't know the cause for fever. That's a GSM. And with this, with this background, five days fever, irritability, mother noting uh, 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 bulging font, we get got into the history in detail. There is no significant past illness. And this is a firstborn to non-consanguinous marriage. Normal delivery, birth weight, good, three kg, unremarkable perinatal history, all vaccines given, exclusively breastfed infant, growing well, weight is around 6.5 kg now, which is normal. This is the scenario. This is the scenario. Next slide, please. On examination, this infant had a obvious bulging fontanel, toxic, irritable, hemodynamically stable, saturation is normal, pulse blood pressure is normal, respiratory rate is okay. There is a mild hepatomegaly, soft and spleen was just tipped with a postgraduate spleen. And the infant did not have new focal neurological deficit, but was crying. Pupils were normal. This is the scenario we had. What's your likely diagnosis for this history? Basically, two or three things come to my mind at this point of time. In fact, syndrome-wise, this is an infant who looks like having an acute CNS infection with raised ICT. That's a syndromic diagnosis I would make. The reasons would be three to four days of fever, a subacute presentation, bulging fontanel in a young infant is very much suggestive of a raised intracranial tension with no drugs exposure causing bulging fontanel, irritability. I would first think of an acute CNS infection. That's my first diagnosis as a priority. Any differentials? Yes, the differentials could be, of course, in, uh, in olden days, the same scenario. Somebody, I said the, there is a history of diarrhea. If somebody had prescribed nalidixic acid, yes, pseudotum cerebri is a possibility. Second, next to CNS infection, which is most likely bacterial, I wouldn't think of a viral infection, though this infant has been having illness for five days, not deteriorating rapidly, in which case I would definitely keep in mind some unusual organisms like viruses causing meningitis. Or I would think of the possibility of if the infant has had some anemia, paler, exclusively breast, breastfed infant, I would have thought of an intracranial Hemorrhage also, which can also fool us with fever, bulging, fontanel. At this point of time, I think my first diagnosis is acute CNS infection. So how are we going to investigate this case? Yeah, basically, the investigation, since there is fever, those complete blood counts are very important. And as you see here in the slide, the counts are definitely abnormal, 23,000 with polymer predominance. Platelets are normal. You look at the CRP, 144, 44 milligram per uh, liter, which is extremely high. Of course, in these days, COVID days, a high CRP, I would also think of COVID-19 as a possibility in addition to Miss C. And definitely in this infant, though the infant has been given antibiotic, I will definitely draw a blood culture sample and I would do a urine routine and if there, have been, if there no other focus is there, I would definitely consider doing a urine culture also, probably catheterize and send a sample immediately. And of course, lumbar puncture, I would certainly do in this infant in whom I'm suspecting acute CNS infection. More so, I don't see any contraindication in this baby with the reports and with the clinical status. That is it, Jason. What do you find in the CSF? Now we did a lumbar puncture with all precautions. Of course, the PG called me and told me it was mildly opalescent. To me, in the, in the video, it didn't look like that. And of course, he said it was not clear, sir. It was under pressure. Of course, we, he did not measure the pressure middle of the night. Two, the cell count was available within half an hour. 
280 cells, most of them polymorphs. It was not traumatic. And the glucose was 20, blood sugar was 84, protein was 100. And uh, we immediately did a culture. And in fact, we are part of a meningitis surveillance study at the National Institute of Epidemiology. So we have a standard protocol of plating the cultures within 15 minutes of the collection of the CSR. So that was plated. And then we proceeded to start treat, treating the child. These are the investigations that were done. At this point, did we consider COVID? Uh, we did consider COVID. I didn't add. We did gene expert, and it is negative. So, what is the first line of choice of antibiotics for them? What did you do immediately? Yeah. See, now with uh, the clinical and uh, CS parameters very much suggestive of acute bacterial meningitis. You call this a partially treated or a. a Acute CNS infection? See, mosquito doses, suffixin for three days. I wouldn't call it partially treated. I would say inappropriately treated. I don't think I will call this partially treated. Suffixin, eight milligram per kg, is not going to do anything. Is not going to penetrate into the CNS and take care of meningitis. Right? So we started treating this as acute bacterial meningitis. And of course, since the child had been exposed to antibiotics, we did not consider giving steroids. We'll come to it later. So we started on ceftriaxone and vancomycin, which is a standard protocol we have been following as part of the meningitis surveillance study based on resistance patterns in our own institution and from CMC Velo. So why did you give dexamethasone? What is the reason for not? See, because in a small baby, dexamethasone would have Reduce complications, isn't it? Why didn't you give it? Extremely good question. If you look at the history of dexamethasone in acute bacterial meningitis, it's a long history. I would say it is like Mohinder Amarnath. It has come and gone. It again makes stage a comeback in these COVID days. Dexamethasone, the rationale for using it has been a success story of reducing Definitely sensory neural deafness in H flu meningitis. There's no controversy at all. Good data is there that if you give dexamethasone to somebody who has H flu meningitis, it reduces the risk of sensory neural deafness, number one. Number two, the other theoretical benefits which have been postulated because of the use of dexamethasone, if you go back into the history, Wherever you give high doses of bactericidal antibiotics in acute severe infection, it is believed that a lot of cytokines will, re will be released more so when you give a bactericidal antibiotic in good dosage. In fact, in meningitis, we give a loading dose of ceftriaxone 100 milligram per kg. So what happens is a huge number of bacilli get killed and they release a lot of cytokines. They result in stimulation of a lot of cytokines as an inflammatory response. So it was believed that if you give dexamethasone, it may suppress the secondary effects by suppressing cytokine release and reducing the amount of LPS, lipopolysaccharides, which may occur secondary to the severe bacterial infection. So this has not been proven in most studies. If you look at data, studies in adult pneumococcal meningitis have shown that it reduces mortality. Pediatric data, there's no hard evidence. Meningococcal meningitis, there is no benefit using dexamethasone or other steroids unless there is adrenal crisis. So today, they say the evidence for H flu is very high, but we don't see H flu. The evidence for pneumococcus is weak, but still it is recommended that if you think it is an antibiotic naive case, you should consider and you should administer dexamethasone 0.15 milligram per kg every six hours, preferably one hour before the antibiotic. Even with the antibiotic, some studies have shown the effect is same. And it is not recommended indefinitely in neonates. Roll below three months is questionable. 
and roll in those who receive mosquito dose of antibiotics. It doesn't happen in the West. It happens only in India. There is no data. Considering all this, we were not sure. We did not give dexamethasone. Yes, Jason. Uh, sir, I think uh, there is a power cut here. So I think Jason, sir, has ex exited. Okay. So I, I will be trying to share this. I'll try to share the slides. Okay, please go ahead. Good that you have a backup. And another benefit of dexamethasone has been the reduction in the incidence of subdural effusion. And this has been most common with H-flu, and this has not been proven with other meningitis like pneumococcal meningitis. In fact, there are reports which suggest that in, in gram-negative meningitis also, steroid might have a role in older children, but it is debated. At present, it is not recommended routinely. Sir, I'm, uh, can you see my slides, sir? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Go to okay. the next slide. Go to the next slide. Okay, sir. Yeah, we finished exam with this one. Go ahead. Yeah, so what we gave was septriaxone plus vancomycin. We gave 100 milligrams. In fact, one of the things I want to stress here, if you have a diagnosis of uh, acute bacterial meningitis, you should give the loading dose of septriaxone. The loading dose is 100 milligram per kg. If you hit heart, you reach a good serum concentration so that there is good bactericidal activity and follow it up with 50 milligram per kg BD intravenously. Vancomycin, we started because of the high incidence of resistance in our own center and in CMC Velour. And what happened the next day morning, the microbiologist called me, sir, we are surprised. We are seeing some gram negative bacilli in the gram stain. And they also said the culture signals are also showing it is gram negative. So my, I called my PG, I told them three months old, gram negative meningitis, stop septraxone and vancomycin, switch to meropinum. You might all think that it may be overkill. There is a rational for it. If it is gram negative, particularly around three months, this baby was three months and 15 days to be very precise, you have to consider other gram-negative organisms, which includes our notorious Klebsiella, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, E. coli, and the best drug is only a carbapenum with or without an aminoglycoside. We start, we escalated the antibiotic to meropenum, and once we knew it is not gram-negative, it is not gram-positive, we discontinued vancomycin to avoid nephrotoxicity in combination with the carbapenum or a, a cephalosporin. This is what we did. Can you have the next slide, please? Ramod, your connection is also lost. Hello, sir, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So we stopped uh, septraxone and uh, vancomycin. We escalated to meropinum. Actually, the next day, the infant was definitely better. Fever spikes had come down. The fontanel had become a little flatter. And irritability had come down. And our microbiologist called us the next morning Sir, this gram-negative bacillus is something unusual. Hello? It looks like salmonella. Yeah, and uh, the earlier tests for differentiation of salmonella, which is typhoidal, and salmonella, which is non-typhoidal, they were carried out by our microbiologist. And she told us, this is non-typhoidal salmonella. And to our further surprise, the microbiologist told us that it is a pan-sensitive organism. It is sensitive to anything from cotrimoxol right up to meropenum and septraxone. So again, 
we de-escalated the antibiotic, we stopped meropinone, and we restarted ceftriaxone alone, 50 milligram per kg, and continued. Have you got the power back? Uh, no? Sir, Jason, sir, has uh, still... No. I will share the next slide. Yeah. Next. You're not sharing the slides. Oh, okay. Now, sir. Okay. Please go to the previous slide. Previous slide. Previous two slides. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, next slide. Next slide. Yeah, this is what happened. Next slide. At this point, Jason has a few questions to me. He says this is a very unusual infection. Yes. Non-typhoidal salmonellosis causing meningitis presenting as pseudotumor cerebri. Extremely unusual. We have not seen a case similar to this because we have seen one enteric fever, salmonella type A causing pseudotumor cerebri. Jason has asked me a question. What is the prevailing, prevailing spectrum of bugs causing bacterial meningitis in newborns and young infants? Extremely important question for practitioners. Those who practice in nursing homes, it's a very important question for choice of antibiotics. You take two groups. Newborns and young infant. When I say newborns and young infants, you can, you can take it up to three months. In general, in India, the organisms causing meningitis in early neonatal period and late neonatal period is not greatly different. In the West, early neonatal meningitis is more due to could be structures, which we don't see at all. In India, both in early neonatal meningitis and late neonatal meningitis and meningitis below three months of age, majority of cases are due to gram-negative organisms starting from E. coli, Klebsiella, Acinetobacter, and Pseudomonas, and Cons, and Staph aureus. These are the usual organisms. Listeria, for some peculiar reasons, is not often grown in India. Ruby streptococcus, the incidence is very low in India. That is the prevailing epidemiology in early and late neonatal meningitis and in meningitis up to the age of three months. Coming to the spectrum of bugs causing meningitis above the age of three months is an entirely different ball game. The commonest organism worldwide is still pneumococcus, except in some areas where meningococcemia and meningococcal meningitis is very common. In southern part of India, it's pneumococcus. We have got good epidemiological data from India itself, number one. Number two, H flu has come down in a big way thanks to the vaccination. Third is meningococcus, which is unusual. All other organisms are unusual. For example, rarely you may get the same organisms which cause meningitis in the newborn. But it also depends on the host. All these organisms which I mentioned are there in immunocompetent hosts. But if you have an unusual host factor, say for example, immunodeficiency or an anatomical defect like a CSF rhinorrhea or an open neural tube defect, the organisms are going to be different. Just to give you an example, if you have a, a hypogamma globinemia, okay, your organisms may be even pseudomonas. If you have a T cell defect, you may have unusual organisms like Burkhardia, Brucella, Salmonella, Listeria, etc. And of course, fungal infections like cryptococcal meningitis. And if you have chronic granulomatous disease, you may have brucellosis, you may have salmonellosis, you may have TB. 
right? Even parasitic infections can cause meningitis in immunocompromised hosts. Once there is CSF rhinorrhea or an open neural tube defect, staphylococcal infection, cons infections are more common than pneumococcus or meningococcus. So it depends on the host spectrum. But by and large, most meningitis in older infants is commonly due to pneumococcus. Unusual organisms may be the cause based on host predisposition for such unusual infections. The next question Jason has asked me, usually a non-typhoidal salmonella is seen in hospital acquired infection. What could be the reason in this exclusively breastfed infant? Extremely good question. We were also wondering, non-typhoidal salmonella, it is necessary to stress some important differences between non-typhoidal salmonella and typhoidal salmonella. What are the differences? Non-typhoidal salmonella usually causes a self-limiting acute bacterial gastroenteritis. It's a very trivial infection in an immunocompetent host. Two, non-typhoidal salmonella has almost the similar epidemiology in terms of transmission, risk, etc., when compared to salmonella, typhi, and paratyphi. Three, non-typhoidal salmonella is a serious illness in the following groups. One, immunocompromised individuals. Two, infants less than three months of age. Three, infants and adults who are receiving acid suppression therapy, hospitalized children, this could occur as a nosocomial infection, children who have received recently some antibiotics, they are prone for non-typhoidal salmonellosis, and immunodeficiencies like T-cell defect, chronic granulomatous disease, gamma interferon defects, Mendelian susceptibility to uh, uh, inherited diseases, they could all be predisposing factors for non-typhoidal salmonella. But it is interesting to note that those infants less than three months, if they ingest non-typhoidal salmonella bacteria, I believe the risk of dissemination is very high. The risk of gastroenteritis is very high, sepsis is high, meningitis is high. The reason is the transit time in the stomach is very small in a young infant. So the acid pH is unable to neutralize rapidly if the bacillary load is high. It goes down and causes sepsis. And if you look at the manifestations of non-typhoidal salmonella, they are very, very diverse. They can cause us gastroenteritis, sepsis, meningitis, endocarditis, osteomyelitis, abscesses, and even pneumonia. That is the difference. Coming to the epidemiology, interestingly, most non-typhoidal salmonellosis occurs in Africa. I believe it is more common in HIV-infected children. Asia also is high, high, but it's not uncommon even in the Western society where hygiene is quite good. Why? Pooled cooking. In fact, it is believed that if you break about 10 eggs and make multiple omelets, when you're breaking the head, when you're breaking the egg shell, the surface may contain the feces of the hen and that may transmit salmonella, store the basandis and ice creams inside the refrigerator live for months. They can cause non-typhoidal salmonellosis. So wherever there is a mela and a large amount of food, food is cooked or salads are used, water is contaminated, Animal exposures, reptiles, lizard, contaminates the food. I believe non-typhoidal salmonella has a high risk of occurrence. That is the interesting story of non-typhoidal salmonella. But the other interesting point we must remember is that gastroenteritis due to non-typhoidal salmonella 
need not be treated with antibiotic studies have shown if you give it ah nalla rasu undu nalla color nalla bangi undu carrier so it doesn't give any benefit but if the child is if the infant is less than 3 months immunocompromised that septic then perhaps we are justified in giving antibiotics for non typhoidal salmonellosis kore 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 that is the hi very good mediki salmonellosis the next question jason has asked me how do we improve our the right very simple answer the answer for him somebody hello i uh, request the person to mute please yeah come on is talking ama chandran ama chandran nalla nalla is mute bhayangare vartana ama chandran somebody is talking ama chandran please mute hello okay jisan is asking can i go ahead yeah yeah jisan is asking a very interesting question how do you improve our confirmation rates of bacterial meningitis the first answer for that question is don't prescribe cefixim like this on day one of fever that's the first step the culture of culturing you should get cultures before giving antibiotic antibiotic giving antibiotic to somebody with suspected meningitis is absolutely right but you can get the bug if you don't give an antibiotic even if you do blood culture even if lumbar puncture is contraindicated in a child due to raised icg you can try to get the bug from the blood culture so culture of culturing is the best way to get the yield one two now you have good culture facilities bacteria facilities are there you have no excuse not to do blood cultures and and csf cultures both should be done for somebody suspected to have bacterial meningitis number 3 you have rapid microbiological techniques pcr is available now we all know multiple platforms are there we know the biofire which will diagnose pneumococcus which will diagnose h2 which will diagnose meningococcus and few other viruses also it's a good good test to perform it is worth it the cost is not very high you should use it most other techniques like 16 as rna are available in some centers new technologies are coming you can use them if you have latex agglutination test is going off for pneumococcus a very cheap test is there pneumococcal antigen detection test is in csf even if you don't grow if you perform an antigen test pneumococcal antigen test it confirms pneumococcal meningitis csf is a sterile space you can't get antigen positivity the pneumococcal antigen test in urine is useless in children but in csf is very very valuable so these are the ways by which you can improve the confirmation rates of bacterial meningitis and culture should be done and immediately transported to a good lab nowadays even small towns have got several good lab facilities would you keep uh, uh, extra sample of uh, yeah PSF? we we do normally keep for two reasons we are part of the uh, epidemiology uh, study for meningitis where they send the sample to john hopkins for pcr as an extra sample so we do keep it we sent this we didn't do biofire for this child for cost because we got the organism and the culture we didn't want to waste our money we didn't do what do you think of tuberculosis at this age yeah we did think of tuberculosis because it's a story of five days you know tb is one disease which can present any way you know i have seen tb meningitis with two days of fever altered sensorium acute encephalitis encephalitis was like presentation but with the bug being identified we didn't do tb testing and other tests the cs are still there in our lab waiting for transportation for pcr studies what's the progress from there yeah fever spaced out in about 4 days but the infant irritability was settling down oral intake was better looking non toxic but to our shock day 4 two seizures brief seizures with altered sensorium for about 5 minutes each we gave a dose of levetiracetam 
The moment we saw the seizure, we knew an imaging was indicated. We got an MRI done, and uh, the MRI pictures are there. And it is up, up to the neurosurgeon to interpret the MRI. But it is reported as patchy meningeal and leptomeningeal enhancement. And it sh did show some area, focal area of hyperintensity with restricted diffusion. In the left high parietal region somewhere there. And uh, the radiologist, the neuroradiologist reported it as a small micro abscess. And in addition, the third one picture shows also an interspheric, interhemispheric fluid collection. We got a neurosurgical consult. He said, Nils surgical at this point of time, too small, focal cerebritis is there, acute meningitis, continue medical management. This is what we did. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, and uh, next, one, next one, next one, next one. In next fact, one. yeah. So, yeah. Dr. Balasubhani, what do you, what do you do if uh, clinically while monitoring this baby with uh, with an acute sinus infection? Do you get your uh, PGs to check the head circumference regularly? Transformation is it done? Do you see subdural effusions uh, like we used to see in the past? We. Of course, nowadays, uh, to be very honest, uh, in this child also, we did not do daily transillumination. Uh, yes, I have done it as a postgraduate myself. My prostate. Nowadays, we don't do it. We don't see so many transillumination. We don't do my prostate will kill me if I uh, if I tell you that we don't do it. But as MD postgraduates, we used to daily show him transillumination every meningitis, particularly in younger infants. We didn't do. Of course, we are measuring the head circumference, monitoring the fever monitoring the sensorium, looking for focal neurological uh, deficit. And uh, subdural effusions, as you rightly said, we don't see as many as we have seen in the past. It may be because of two reasons. One, subdural effusion is notoriously common in H-flu, which we don't see at all. Two, probably they're all coming in early. Three, we have good antibiotics and we are treating effectively. And nowadays, the moment you suspect subdural effusion, I don't think we do transillumination. We do a CTR, preferably an MRI. That's what we do. Yeah. Was the seizures? Uh, what are the timing and the cause for seizures in meningitis here yeah. in this child? It's extremely important question for young postgraduates who are attending. There are two types of seizures which occur in acute bacterial meningitis. The first one usually occurs on day one. You know, they present like almost atypical febrile seizures. Then you find the child is drowsy. Then you do a lumbar puncture. It turns out to be meningitis. That is day one seizure. Second group, during the treatment, inside the hospital, day four or beyond, you get seizures. It's very important to have a cutoff point of four days. If seizures occur within the first four, four days, it is a primary manifestation of meningitis. The seizures occur beyond four days. It is a serious complication of bacterial meningitis. Two, if you have men meningitis with seizures in the first four days, the prognosis is not greatly affected because of the occurrence of seizure. Whereas if it occurs beyond four days, the prognosis is likely to be adverse. Coming to the complications, Complications, any number, in fact, it's a, it's a good essay question for postgraduates. Immediate and late complications. Immediate complications, of course, death due to raised ICT. All complications of sepsis, including shock, DIVC, DIVC, multi organ dysfunction syndrome, metastatic abscess, cerebral abscess, cerebritis, subdural empyema brain abscess, associated myocarditis, lung abscess, septic arthritis, secondary to the primary infection, and of course, optic atrophy, sensory neural deafness, quite a significant number do develop, subdural effusion, lateral venous trinus thrombosis, arterial stroke, and almost a presentation of spastic diplegia or quadriplegia and the child suffering from sequelae. These are all the complications which can occur. In terms of monitoring, it is essentially clinical. 
And whenever you have a focal neurological deficit, definitely an imaging of MRI is indicated. Now, what is, did you change the antibiotics when the seizures occurred? You found the uh, axis? We did not change the antibiotic. Why? For the simple reason, we got the bug and it was again the sensitivity was checked. The child was overall responding in, the, in terms of uh, fever, general activity. So we didn't change the antibiotic. We continued the antibiotic IV with, uh, with the central line for four full weeks. And we repeated the blood culture with a sterile. And meanwhile, we also did a complete immunodeficiency workup. And your CSF showed a pan-sensitive uh, CSF. You didn't change the antibiotic? No, it's a ceftriaxone. We gave ceftriaxone. And change your de-escalated? Yeah, change it from meropenum to ceftriaxone. We de-escalated. Yeah. 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 All this uh, I finished when you are off uh, the... Okay, okay. Yeah. okay fine. all this, no? Yeah, finish, finish. How did this come? We're going back, uh, Pramod. Yeah. yeah, all this has been yeah. completed. Yeah, finally, we gave four weeks of subtraction of the central line. The child is completely recovered, no neurological deficit. We didn't repeat CSF, we repeated blood cultures, which were negative. And of course, we could not do Bera because of the lockdown. On follow-up, uh, we will. Uh, they, we are waiting for the child to come up. We'll do a Bera. We should have done it. I'm honest in telling we could not do because the Bera technician did not come because of the lockdown. And PID workup, immunoglobulins, uh, uh, NBT tests, flow cytometry, HIV, and uh, an ultrasound for asplenia and a peripheral smear for evidence of asplenia uh, was completed. We didn't do complement uh, uh, estimation. And the baby is well, neurologically intact. For sal salmonella, what is the common immunodeficiency that uh, it's in? That you see? see, salmonella is notoriously common in T cell defects and in Mendelian, in uh, gamma interferon defects. These are the two common uh, uh, immunodeficiencies, and including chronic granulomatous disease, which can predispose to salmonella. So you haven't done a NBT and a DHA? NBT, everything NBT we have done, it is negative. We didn't do DHA, we did only an NBT, and we did uh, only a, a, a HIV, we did the immunoglobulin, and uh, we did the flow cytometry. Normally, in our protocol in the hospital, as part of immunodeficiency workup, we send the samples to National Institute of Immunohematology for a complete uh, panel, but because of the lockdown, we are, they are not accepting uh, parcel samples, we are not sending. We'll Dr. Jason, can I suggest a comment? Yeah. Another case. Yeah. Listen, sir. Yeah. So, we have similar case, almost same type of cases. Two and a half month old child, meningitis, LP done, they are native, salmonella, non typhoid. We send the CSF sample to Calcutta Renal Center, Tropical Pediatric Center. We go to salmonella and red Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is sensitive to all drugs. This child was also only breastfeeding baby. But we had done one thing extra. We collected the sample from the well and we got the same organism for the well water. Or repeatedly asking, they told that they used to give tenum vimbo. Tenum vimbo means it is honey with some water and they mix it to give the baby. This two and a half month old baby only. Yeah. Then what happened means the child got the uh, embyema again, and we had an MRI. Embyema again, we uh, neurosurgery consultation done. We got the same organism there also. But unfortunately, what happened to in our case was we already started ceftriaxone, but I don't know, I can comment here or not. Our ceftriaxone uh, garment supply was not good. If we change the ceftriaxone to another brand, private brand, then we got a very good response. After four weeks, child is doing extremely very good with the normal follow up also very good. And luckily, the child got a viral also positive later. Okay. Okay, I, uh, let me give my comments on a very interesting Ananda Yeah. Uh, two or three things I would say. I agree with you. It's very unusual. In this case, we got a stool culture done for the mother. It was negative. And uh, they denied giving any water or anything. Of course, we didn't. We are not going to investigate well water. 
the point that raised by that is raised by you it is not enough if you diagnose non typhoid salmonellosis you must actually do an outbreak uh, uh, study you are very right the same thing had happened in us the entire uh, area would have been screened because usually uh, the 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 cattle and the reptiles are responsible that is one second is dr anand kesan my gentle request is please don't mention vidal it should not be done when you have got culture positivity doing vidal and no, no. i don't want the audience to take a wrong message yeah. please don't do vidal i'm sorry i'm sorry dr anand kesavan and we are not we then out of curiosity yes. only because you uh, patient have improved wait wait wait, wait please yeah, yeah. you yeah, respect yeah. to you please don't mention the audience will take it as a wrong message vidal should not be done in fact we have stopped doing vidal for even entry fever and for non typhoid salmonella it is useless you should not be doing third thing is they, what you have done is correct we also have the sample of the blood culture unfortunately again locked down we have not sent, we normally send it to maulana azad medical college which is a salmonella uh, uh, what you call resource center where they try to we don't know what type of salmonella whether it is entered you know the names of salmonella non type one salmonella are very interesting they are all placed on the ports dublin yeah. newport entritidis and tasmurium uh, tasmurium etc right you know Sir, why does never influence our treatment or anything like that? No, patient no. discharged, then no. we are done out of curiosity. What will happen to why does not take for it? No, no, my. Shall we? Respect. Shall we carry you? Carry on with the case. We'll have the discussion later. Please, Dr. Vidal. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So then, the hearing and vision are sensory inputs that the baby wants to preserve. So let's hear from the expert how he would advise follow up, and what follow up tests are recommended when cochlear implant ideally is done. and what his experiences on post meningitic cochlear implant and for this we have with us dr matthew dominic who is a ms frcs is a done as yellow and ms cnt from cnc below frcs edinburgh and he's a consultant ent surgeon at an cochlear implant surgeon at medical trust hospital kochi his post graduate training in cochlear implant surgery from the university of melbourne is a past president of the a a o i kerala an organizing chairman of the cochlear implant group of india annual conference over to you matthew for your presentation matthew please unmute can you hear me now yeah thank you jason for your kind introduction and thank you for inviting me to share this platform with such august audience and uh, faculty and uh, thanks for a very big effort in organizing such a meeting It's been going on for 16 sessions congratulations to you i i'll be talking about uh, um, uh, meningitis and uh, hearing loss meningitis is the single most co- important cause of sensory and hearing impairment in children more than half the acquired case of deafness are due to meningitis the incidence varies there are various reports about it being about 5% to 35% in the uk it's about 7.5% netherlands it is about 13 there is a paper published in the indian pediatric uh, journal in 1996 from uh, lady harding in delhi they put the uh, indian statistics at around 27% of the children with meningitis having hearing loss in kenya it's almost as i has a 43% the type of hearing loss that you have in uh, meningitis is sensory neural because it's involving the inner ear about two third of them will have mild to moderate sensory neural hearing loss and about one third will have profound hearing loss and this will require cochlear implantation next slide please there are various risk factors if the child continues to have seizures and fever after initiating adequate treatment these children are likely to have hearing loss after the meningitis so also if they have any cranial nerve neuropathy or a positive cs culture or a gram stain which is positive they are likely to have uh, hearing loss other risk factors are probably a low gcs uh, comma scale male gender has been implicated having uh, hearing losses earlier age of onset below the age of 12 months and hospital stay more than 10 week 10 days how does the infection spread from the meninges to the to the cochlea 
most of the infection usually start in the uh, there are a lot of autogenic meningitis so from the tympanic membrane it can go through the hole window or the round window or it can spread through the blood cochlear aqueduct is probably one of the reasons why you have spread of infections from the meninges to the inner ear can you have the next slide please cochlear aqueduct connects the csf space with the perilymphatic space so it can actually spread from the csf to the perilymph and cause an infection inside the cochlea next one please okay that is just an animation showing through that one. what happens once the infection gets into the cochlea <clears throat> There is a florid inflammatory response, of which the most important one is osteoid deposition, bone deposition inside the cochlear duct. It starts from the base and goes up to the apex. And with this, there is an obliteration of the cochlear duct, which may which causes hearing loss and makes cochlear implantation difficult. It can start as early as two weeks, and he said it's, it can go as long as four, four years. How do you assess the hearing loss? <clears throat> Tympanometry autocoustic emission, where are the tests that is done? Why do you do a tympanometry? Tympanometry is to assess the middle ear function. Most of these are children, they are likely to have a middle ear infection also. And that will cause a conductive hearing loss that will actually give you a false positive autocoustic emission test. So you have to make sure that the, uh, the middle ear is settled. There is no fluid inside the middle ear. Once the tympanometry is normal, you do an auto-questing emission, which is actually a screening test. It will tell you the how the outer ear hair cells are functioning. And if it is positive, it means that the child has got a hearing loss, I mean, a normal hearing. If it is negative, or what we call as a refer, the child has got a hearing loss. But the quantum of hearing loss, how much hearing loss the child has, we will not be able to assess. And if the child has got a refer, or the auto emission test is negative, we ask for a BERA, which is the gold standard for assessing the hearing loss. When do you test the hearing loss uh, in a child? If there is a hearing loss that is suspected in the hospital, it should be done before the child leaves the hospital. If there is no suspicion of a hearing loss, it can be done when the patient comes for uh, comes on a, on a review. And it should be done every three to four months for the next two years. That is the recommended design. What we feel is that all children should have a hearing test done before they leave the hospital because they're reluctant to have a test once it is already done. Or once the child has gone back and if the child has got a mild hearing loss, they'll be reluctant to have a hearing test. Done. So we would recommend a hearing test for all meningitis children before they leave the hospital. What happens to a child who has got a hearing loss? There is a social impact of the hearing loss and then the medical this one. The medical one is the fact that the child will stop, will stop hearing and with the loss of hearing, the speech also is going to come down. What about the social impact? You would have heard about Helen Keller. She was, not, she was born as a normal child, went through her teenage years in adult life, hearing and seeing. And then she lost both her vision and hearing. Later on in a memoir, she wrote, if I were to be born again and I had to choose between blindness and deafness, I would choose to be blind. She said the blind always get all the sympathy. The deaf are looked down with contempt and ridicule. Now, how do you manage a, a child with sensorineural hearing loss? If it's a mild to moderate hearing loss, you can give a hearing aid. If it is severe or profound, the child will require a cochlear implant. So about what is a hearing aid? Well, a hearing aid has got a microphone. It amplifies the sound and gives it to the ear through a speaker. What is a cochlear implant? It is a hearing process designed to restore hearing to patients with profound bilateral hearing who get limited benefit from hearing aid. So that is the place when the hearing aid is not enough. That is the time that you would give an implant. Basically, what is the difference? The hearing aid, uh, a microphone picks up the sound. It amplifies the sound and gives it to the ear. Now, the ear, the ear itself analyzes the sound, converts into electrical activity the brain can understand. So you have to have a functioning ear to use a hearing aid. What about a cochlear implant? Cochlear implant, the microphone picks up the sound. There is something called the speech processor. It does exactly what the ear does. It analyzes the sound, coats it, converts it into electrical activity, which the brain can understand. So that is the basic difference. The speech processor is exactly acts like a bionic ear. Next slide, please. But one of the problems in meningitis is 
in the cochlear implant you have an electrode which has to go into the cochlear duct next slide please the cochlea has got uh, uh, three uh, divisions one is the scala vestibula is the scala media and the scala tympani these are all fluid filled these are fluid filled cavities and the electrode actually goes into the scala tympani so you need to have a patent scala tympani to insert the electrode next one the usual cochlear implant has got 22 electrodes these electrodes are in, inserted in the scala tympani of the cochlear lumen so you should you should have a near normal normal or near normal lumen to insert the electrode you should be able to get in at least 12 to 14 electrodes to get an adequate outcome cochlear ostomy can start very early within even 2 weeks and it proceeds very fast with the cochlear uh, ossification it might become impossible or ineffective to do a cochlear implant the best way to identify is a t2 weighted uh, mri which will give you the fluid inside the cochlea next one please this is a, a normal cochlea and an ossified cochlea ignore the next one see here you can see the seventh nerve with this uh, meningeal covering which has got csf with fluid fill and on a t2 it is lighting up and also the fluid inside the cochlea is lighting up that is on the left side if you look on the right side that cochlea is ossified and it is not lighting up so this is a very good way to assess the uh, patency of the cochlear duct next one we know about the role of steroids it is uh, said to reduce the incidence of hearing loss especially in hf influenza and as we all know and as i don't have really that it is to be instituted as early as possible next one this is a child we had operated uh, with uh, meningitis he was about 4 years old when he came to us i mean admitted in pediatrics with meningitis he stayed in the hospital for about 15 days during the 15 days the parents didn't notice any hearing loss but as soon as the child went home the parents started noticing a hearing loss and he was brought back we did all the assessment and we found that there is no hearing in either ear the chassis temple bone was done in january 2013 which was normal the cochlear duct at that time was normal because of the uh, uh, financial constraints we waited for a government implant you know that uh, kerala has got a government program they give you free implants and during the wait from uh, december till june his speech started going down from december by march he was not speaking this is a child was going to a normal school he was going to a play school but within 3 months his hearing had i mean speech had actually did. hearing had gone off completely and speech had also gone off completely uh, we finally got the implant a repeat hrct was done those times in 2013 me doing uh, mr uh, hrct is rather than mr and in that itself both the cochlea were found ossified but in spite of that we went ahead we used it into electrode straight uh, electrode for cochlear implantation we actually operated on the right side if try to put in the electrode there is something called a depth cage to assess how much the, the electrode will go we thought that was not adequate we came to the left side operated the left side on the same city we again we went in with the depth cage but we could put it to only 11 electrodes went back to the right side we were able to get in 14 electrodes out of the 22 we are able to put in 14 electrodes uh outcome i would wanted to show you the video but then uh, this is not playing uh it's fine uh, previous slide this is a child now is previous slide please i mean next one next one next one the child's photograph okay this child is now about uh, 14 or 13 years old he is actually going to school he is uh, going, attending a normal school he is able to hear everything he is able to speak very clearly but his speech is slightly slow apart from that we have been able to rehabilitate him and put him in a normal school and i think the outcome was very good we have something called a cap score from 0 to 12 and 12 is normal 0 is nil he has reached up to 10 which i think is very good next one please next slide to conclude when you just can you have the previous slide the most common cause of acquired deafness in children incidence is up to 35% out of 
I feel that all children with meningitis should have a hearing assessment before they leave the hospital with a demonometry, autocystic emission, and maybe a bara. And a, uh, MRI is better for assessment of the cochlear lumen. And cochlear implant, if a child has got a severe hearing loss, should be done as early as possible because the chance of ossification and difficulty in doing an implant. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much, Matthew. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you. I don't think we have, our PG should have go, should see how a bara is done. That's something that they must see. Now, we now, we hope all these babies in India will recover like this child that Dr. Balasab presented. But complications are reality, and some of them require surgical intervention. And why Dr. Gopal shouldn't forget, sir, 13 years of experience, discuss the management of ventricolitis and post meningitic hydrocopalus. Next slide, Dr. T.B. Gopalashan is the consultant pediatric neurosurgeon at Astro Med City. He did his uh, uh, MCH neurosurgery from SCT Trivandrum and then got trained at Switzerland and Canada. He's got 13 years of experience and he specializes in all kinds of pediatric neurosurgical procedures like complex brain and spinal disorders, surgery for brain tumors, minimal invasive surgery, dorsal rhizotomies for spasticity, spina bifida, cranial, craniofacial surgeries, name it, anything that a neurosurgeon could do a, on a child's brain, he's done it. Over to you, Dr. Gopalishan. He's talking from Dubai where he's out of his, uh, he's doing a case in between, he's come and helped us to, uh, to do this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Gopalishan, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Jason. Uh... Thank you for inviting me and uh, it's a privilege to be among the finest of pediatricians. Uh, I know how much of role I'll play as a pediatric neurosurgeon here for meningitis, but we do often get kids with uh, late sequelae of meningitis and especially ventriculitis. So I thought I'll just uh, talk a few words about ventriculitis, which um, we know is inflammation of the ependymal lining of the cerebral ventricles. Uh, it's given as other synonyms, ep ependymitis, ventricular empyma, pyocephalus, pyogenic ventriculitis. It's an indolent but a lethal infection. And often it is a persistent source of infection following meningitis. And we often find that um, meningitis can be pretty chronic. And in those cases, we need to think about ventriculitis because the infection in the ependyma often seems to persist. Early diagnosis is essential for an appropriate treatment. Next slide. Yeah, it's more common in infants. Uh, risk factors, as we all know, for any kind of CNS infections is a low host immunity and a higher virulence of the causative organism. Often the meningitis fails to respond to antibiotics. And as I mentioned, in those cases, ventriculitis should be considered. The mechanisms for ventriculitis include a direct hematogenous spread through the choroid plexus. And often the problem with uh, uh, ventriculitis is it causes hydrocephalus and not just hydrocephalus, but it causes multiloculated hydrocephalus which often leads to loculations within the ventricle that worsens the prognosis. Of course, this is more common with bacterial infections. Um, I always uh, uh, prefer to talk about cranial ultrasounds here because I'm a person who doesn't really advocate any kind of uh, CTs in kids. So ultrasound, especially in um, trained uh, pediatric uh, uh, neurosonologists, they can pick up a lot of things, maximum utility when the anterior fontanelle is patent and it's ex extremely useful for serial assessments of ventriculomegaly. And uh, the ultrasound plays a predominant role, especially in multiloculated hydrocephalus where you can actually pick up these loculations. Next slide. So what do you see on, in an ultrasound? You see this increased thickness, the irregularity and the echogenicity of the ependyma with a lot of debris within the ventricle. There can be septa which are formed leading to compartmentalization. And also we see that the ventricles are dilated. There is increased echogenicity in the periventricular regions that is just outside the ependyma, uh, ependyma, ependyma 
where you see a lot of infiltration with lymphocytes and plasma cells. So that's what leads to this increased echogenicity. And also the ultrasound is helpful post uh, shunt surgeries where um, you can detect any kind of CSF loculations at the tip of the shunt tubes, especially when the shunts get infected. Next slide. So this is, uh, this is a typical what you see on a post-autopsy study of the brain where you see all these uh, uh, evidence of uh, meningitis. We can see scarring of the arachnoid villi. And this is what causes an absorptive defect for the CSF. Next slide. And of course, uh, as we saw in the earlier slide about the MRI, which shows um, meningitis very well, especially the contrast MRI, which shows the enhancement of the basal meninges which can be seen in these slides. Of course, the MRI is very helpful in um, finding out the presence of hydrocephalus, the presence of loculations, which is important in deciding what kind of a surgery we are going to perform. Now, it does often lead to a communicating form of hydrocephalus, but I wouldn't always use the term communicating because there is some kind of an absorptive defect which is happening following meningitis. So, because the arachnoid will lie, they get uh, scarred. There is an absorption problem which is happening. So it's probably more of a, um, a mixture of a communicating and an obstructive kind of hydrocephalus. Next slide. So what do we do? Often, um, as I said, we are called in late, you know, especially post meningitis. The child is having hydrocephalus. Um, just the previous slide. Yeah. So post uh, meningitis, the child has hydrocephalus. And uh, if what we generally need to do is initially, if the hydrocephalus is acute, we place an external ventricular drain because that is not the ideal time for putting in a shunt. So for putting in a shunt, the CSF has to be relatively normal. So what we end up doing is putting an external ventricular drain, allow the CSF to drain out, which hastens the process of the CSF becoming clear. And since the EVD can, cannot be maintained indefinitely, we, uh, we generally sometimes, you know, uh, most of the times we kind of uh, clamp the EVD, see if the child is tolerating. If the child is unable to tolerate, of course, the child will end up requiring a permanent shunt. Next slide. Sometimes we pay, place these uh, temporary IV reservoirs which are called as Omaya reservoirs, which also uh, are, um, uh, are helpful in tapping CSF. Um, Omaya helps in one way is because you don't have an external ventricular drain going to the outside where the child needs to be very actively managed by the nurse. You need to adjust the height of the drain so that it doesn't lead to an over drainage, which is far more lethal than under drainage. So, so if you have an Omaya reservoir, you can always put in a needle through the skin, tap the Omaya reservoir and tap CSF. So that helps in managing the kids better. Next. So treatment for ventriculitis, we have the option of directly instilling antibiotics into the ventricle. So suppose you have an external ventricular drain or as I mentioned, an Omaya reservoir, we can use antibiotics like vancomycin and gentamicin. Uh, depending, actually, we can use quite a few of the antibiotics that depends on what our microbiologist feels is better. This regimen also helps us to achieve a higher ventricular CSF level of the antibiotics. And uh, of course, if the child already has an infected shunt, then the entire hardware has to come out, especially if it has catheter related infection. Next. So this is a ventricular subgalial shunt especially for pre-termers and term babies, not even term, mostly in pre-termers, where we just create a gap. We put in a tube into the ventricle and allow it to drain into the subgalial space. Next slide. And you see this kind of a CSF collection underneath the scalp, which uh, allows for the CSF to drain out, helps with the hydrocephalus, and we can tap this uh, fluid collection on the outside to uh, remove the CSF. But in cases of ventriculite, it is more preferable to do the Omaya reservoir or place an external ventricular drain provided your nurse is able to manage these children with the EVD. 
Surgical options, we all know, are the ventricular shunts. We do endoscopy, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, and some combined procedures where you need to use the endoscope in order to fenestrate for multiloculated hydrocephalus. Next slide. So this is what we commonly do, the ventricular shunting system. Uh, I just put in a slide for the ventriculoatrial shunt, which of course is not the first procedure. We do a ventriculoperitoneal shunt. The ventriculoperitoneal shunt is ideally needs to be done when the CSF is relatively normal, where the cell count is normal, cultures are negative, the protein level is low, and uh, we end up doing a ventriculoperitoneal shunt. The, there are different types of shunts available, like the next slide. We have the programmable shunt. Many of the times, if the CSF is not absolutely normal, we don't place a programmable shunt just in case if there is a recurrence of infection or the infection doesn't really go away, then this entire hardware has to be thrown away. And in an Indian setting, it's extremely expensive. So in the Indian setting, we have the Indian shunts like the Chabra shunt, which is available, which is much cheaper for the uh, population. And we end up putting those Indian shunts. Next slide. So these are the different types of valves which are available. Um, we try to keep it as simple as possible in the cases of uh, post meningitic shunts. We don't put too many complicated valves just because it's been a post infective state. Next. Uh, this was just a, a, a slide which I picked up as to what we describe as, you know, what is contamination of the CSF, what is colonization and what is infection. So basically, uh, uh, the other thing we also wanted to really think about is as to when would you put in a shunt, you know, we always put in a shunt once the CSF is normal. Okay, so there are many studies which talk about protein level in shunts. You know, if the protein level is high, people say we should not put the shunt in because it will get obstructed. Yes, we do wait till a level that the protein level comes down to say less than 200 because many of the time the protein does remain high for quite some time. But there are shunts which have got a slightly uh, better uh, valve system where it doesn't really get blocked. So it's it's a it's it's a individualized approach basically as to when we can reimplant the shunt. The next slide. Endoscopic third ventriculostomy. There are people who are doing it, but uh, ETV procedure is where we make a hole in the floor of the third ventricle rather than put in a shunt. But in cases of meningitis, it really doesn't work. So if you look at this, what is called as the ETV success score? If you look at the etiology. If it's post-infectious, it usually fails. So we don't generally recommend an endoscopic third ventriculostomy procedure for hydrocephalus in children post-meningitis, okay? But there are people abroad who do that. There is no harm in trying it out. The reason being it's absolutely free of any hardware. So you could try it out. If it fails, end up doing a shunt. I think um, that's where we come in for these uh, children with meningitis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gopal, for sparing your time for, for us. Uh, shall we go to questions or do we do the... So, another question I asked, any predisposing condition in this case, Dr. Gopal Subramanian, we have already mentioned all the, uh, why this, uh, what the predisposing causes are. Any culture test was done on drinking water. That's what he's explained. And can you, can you, uh, do you want to elaborate anything more on that? Uh, to the best of our efforts, we could not identify any obvious predisposing condition. As I mentioned earlier, pre predisposing condition for this young infant was the age itself. I mentioned that uh, in young infants, uh, because they don't uh, uh, take much time, they don't, the, 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 it, the, it all depends on the bacterial load. If the load is very heavy and uh, because of this short transit time from the stomach to intestines, salmonella is not neutralized by the acid pH in the stomach. It goes to the intestine, it can cause bacteremia. That is what uh, the journals and books mention. This infant was not artificially fed. The mother also denied that she gave any water or native medication. 
we have absolutely no clue as to how it got the only time the mother said about 2 weeks before she had given some dairy milk and she said she boiled and gave obviously that must have uh, triggered we don't know and in terms of predisposing conditions we nearly ruled out everything possible with facility with uh, investigation we have not found anything there is no clue as of now of course we will follow up the infant we will in the infant comes we will do one more immunodeficiency screen and send to national institute of immunohematology for further work up and uh, we will repeat the counts and monitor the child and assess the child and follow up the child right now the answer is we do not know and we do not know the source of infection at all you are not audible jason you are not audible so dr nagalata has asked whether how do you am i gone off again yeah you are you are audible now yeah so i was uh, dr nagalata has asked why did it happen in exclusive breastfeed baby we don't know the only exposure was some uh, 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 dairy milk about 2 weeks back Have you seen pneumococcal meningitis in the first month? First month we have not seen. We have not seen, but it has been reported. Now, Dr. Rekha Sakre has asked, "What would you do a repeat LP? Yes, if uh, when yeah. do you do that? What are the, indica- the, the indications for repeat LP are one neonatal meningitis. Yes, you should repeat to decide the duration and sterilization of CSF. Two. as a rule gram negative meningitis you have to do that's what textbooks mention three when you grow a drug resistant organism like uh, penicillin resistant pneumococcus in this infant we repeated only blood culture we did not repeat lumbar puncture because we completed four weeks of therapy crp was negative procalcitonin on follow up was negative the infant was doing well and we stopped at the end of four weeks we did not repeat the lumbar puncture because we are sure about the diagnosis we got the bug we got the sensitivity and the child infant improved so we did not repeat the lumbar puncture but the rules are gram negative meningitis yes neonatal meningitis yes drug resistant pneumococcus or drug resistant meningitis yes but other than that routine lumbar puncture in an improving infant is not routinely indicated Dr. Gopalshan, how did you how do you diagnose a mental illness? And uh, uh, see, we wouldn't routinely do a, a, a CSF from the ventricles. What? How do you think about it? And wh- when do you diagnose that? See, as long as uh, the infection is under control, we don't we don't end up really diagnosing ventriculitis. Many of the times, it is there as part of the meningitic process. Yes, in some infants, you know, we do tap the ventricle. you know with an open anterior fontanel you can tap the ventricle but that's not a routine what we sometimes do is if um, the ventricles are dilated the af is full you know if there are features suggestive of icp uh, i'm not sure if you know lp cannot be done because of a sudden uh, coning which can result from rapid release of csf from the lumbar puncture site um, we can tap the ventricle and when we tap the ventricle when we send the csf um if the csf is suggestive of a of a meningitic picture then we can possibly say it's ventriculitis the other way to find it out is of course um, as i said ultrasound ultrasound can help in uh, diagnosing ventriculitis because of the debris and the way the ependyma looks like and of course mri but uh, ultrasound is good enough a good sonogram will help how often would you Uh, advise ultrasound in a in a child with uh, when do you advise ultrasound neuro ultrasonography in a child with meningitis so if the child is having a tense fontanel you're looking at head circumferences which are going up at least we do a baseline ultrasound to look how the ventricles are and then usually we monitor the head circumference and the af um as a routine if it is generally stable it's not going up then once in 5 to 7 days is when we keep repeating the ultrasound to look for the increase in ventricular size it's more on a clinical judgment actually you know 
how the child is doing, if the head circumferences are causing percentiles, if the AF is remaining tense or full. But if the AF is remaining tense or full and the ventricles are up, I generally don't wait. I would tap the ventricle. Now, when you put a shunt, do you, I, I don't think you'll give up ever. You go on repeating shunts. What, what's the reason for that? You go on, you know, if there's an infection, you remove, put it again, you go on, and the children are, uh, you know, repeatedly. How, how, many how many times have you shunted a child? I have shunted a child. One of, I think the number of times uh, max I have shunted a child is 16 times. 16 times. 16 and what's the outcome? Uh, child's alive, doing well. <laughs> I think the 16th was my last time I shunted that child. And after that, the child was okay. So basically, once you put in a shunt in a child, the child is yours forever. You know, that's what the dictum is. And um, you can't really predict when a shunt will fail. Either it could be a mechanical obstruction or a shunt getting infected. But then you just keep following up these children and at any point, I've seen shunts getting infected 10 years after a shunt was placed or a shunt having a mechanical failure years and years after it was placed. So, of course, the, the, the chances keep coming down progressively, but then it can happen at any point in time. We'd never give up? No, we don't. So, as that's, long as the child the... is symptomatic, but many, and sometimes what happens is they do develop compensatory mechanisms over time. The body takes care of it. And that's when we reach a stage which is called as arrested hydrocephalus, where the shunt is actually not working. It's not doing its job. So if the shunt does fail and the child remains to be asymptomatic, that's when we decide not to even revise the shunt. Dr. Matthew, there's a question on, uh, uh, if you have a cochlear implant, you, you did it on the left side and it on the right side. And uh, uh, what is the prognosis of uh, a severe uh, hearing loss, you know, uh, the cochlear implant compared to other causes for hearing loss, postmenditic hearing loss versus other other causes? See, uh, there is no difference as long as you're able to get the implant into the cochlea. If you can get all that into electrodes, the outcome will be exactly the same. Even this child, where we were able to get only 14 electrodes in. Child has got good hearing, excellent hearing. Child is able to hear everything, understand everything. His speech is not the best, but he is able to communicate very well. There is clarity of speech. I wish I was able to show you the video, but it is just that. So there is no difference in doing it so for a child who is probably the most common cause for doing it is congenital hearing loss. That is probably 80% of our implant is done, 90% of the implant is done for children who are born deaf. And they and the very few that we have done for uh, uh, meningitis, they do extremely the same way. There is no difference at all. Now, there's a question. There's a question. Do you replace these shunts, these uh, cochlear implants, do, where they grow up? No. See, there are two parts to the cochlear implant. One is the internal part where we put in the electrode. Okay, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi has asked that question. And the other one is an external part. The internal part, it has got a life of about 90 years. So they'll probably outlive the child. So there is no reason why you should be taking out the implant at all. Very rarely would you get a failure of the implant. It does not need electricity and it, do, it does not have any moving parts. So once it is implanted, it is there for life. Now, after pneumococcal vaccine has come, has there been a reduction in the incidence of hearing loss post there, there is on the Western literature, yes. They are saying there is a reduction in the number of cases of uh, hearing loss post meningitis. We don't have any data on that one, but Western literature definitely says yes. Okay, we'll, we'll go to the quiz because there are a lot of questions on the uh, chat box. So we'll. Uh... Okay. Can I share the quiz questions? Visible? No. I not no. I went out and came in. Shall I share the screen? I think so. 
I think so. You you do that. One minute. Straight the top, yeah. Is it visible? Yeah, it's visible. Next slide. Yeah, you go ahead, uh, Jason. So the first question is, uh, PGs, you know how to answer the question? You, which is the slide they've shown? The next slide, just show the next slide. Next slide is showing the answer. Shall I skip it? No, 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 no. Uh, then you need to put the... Uh, oh, I'll, I'll share. Say, I'll share. Uh, only this I have got. Okay. Let me see if I can share. Just stop sharing. No, I don't have the questions alone. You have uh, sent me you, the questions and okay, uh, you, you you stop sharing then. Okay, I, I'll stop sharing. One minute on that. One minute. One minute. Stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah. If I can share. Is it coming? Not yet. You started. Yeah. Okay. So, shall we start? Are the PGs ready? So, first question is non obstructive nor or communicative hydrocarbons may follow the following conditions except. The peritoneal hemorrhage, pneumococcal meningitis, tuberculosis meningitis, leukemic infiltrates, and a vein of gallon inflammation. Are there no PGs around? Okay, I'll see the next one. Relapses can be treated with antibiotics without surgery in the following conditions except abscess less than two centimeters in diameter, illness is of short duration, less than two weeks, lesion is located in the posterior fossa, no sign of intracental intention, the child is neurologically intact. Third question is, which of the following is indicative of viral and not a bacterial meningitis? PSF opening pressure 90 to 200 millimeters water, WBC count of 10 to 20, 10 to 300, 340 millimeter. PSF opening pressure 200 to 300 millimeters of water, WBC count 10 to 5,000 millimeters of water. CSF opening pressure of 18 to 300 millimeters of water, CBC, WBC count of more than 100 cubic millimeter and the CS of opening pressure of 80 to 200 millimeters out of 5 cubic millimeter. Jason sir, there is nobody to answer. I think we'll, we'll stop it. Yeah. We'll, uh, uh, the, I don't think there are any PGs around. So we'll stop it. We'll just go through the answer so that uh, later the PGs are answering. Uh, okay. We'll just go through the quiz answers so that uh, later if PGs are looking at the presentation in the YouTube, we can go through that. Uh, let me start with the Dr. Gobalishan, your yeah. first question. Yeah. So uh, the question is about uh, communicating hydrocephalus. So when we talk about communicating hydrocephalus, we mean that the ventricles are all patent. There is no evidence of any obstruction happening anywhere. The entire CSF system is patent. So when we look at uh, options of subarachnoid hemorrhage and the different forms of meningitis, 
there is some amount of um, scarring happening at the level of the CSF resorptive areas, that is the arachnoid granulations. So in all these first four choices, um, you'll find some amount of scarring happening, the CSF resorption not happening, places where they should be. So all of them lead to a communicating hydrocephalus. A vein of gallon malformation is, um, is can expand, it's, a, it's, it's in the midline, and it often can cause an obstructive hydrocephalus because it obstructs the aqueduct of Sylvius and causes a proximal obstructive hydrocephalus. So the answer is 1E. E. Thank you. Next question is a brain abscess can be treated? Yeah. You so yeah, so the brain abscess can be treated with antibiotics without surgery in the following conditions except so many of the brain abscesses that we see in the supratentorial location, which means in the cerebral hemispheres, can often be treated uh, medically, except for ones which are large, especially more than 2.5 centimeters, um, which are quite superficial in location where it can be easily surgically accessed. Because in many of these cases, you may require the pus to find out what it shows in culture and sensitivity. But smaller abscesses where the illness is of a shorter duration, the child is absolutely neurologically intact and no evidence of increased intracranial pressure, you don't have to get in for a surgery. Posterior fossa abscesses, of course, uh, need to be surgically drained. The reason being the posterior fossa is a more contained area where any form of extra volume can uh, lead to uh, can lead to a neurological problem as well as um, um, uh, pressure on the brain stem on the tonsils leading to herniation so ideally a posterior fossa abscess should be drained because it leads to edema on the cerebellar hemispheres which can cause a neurological problem so the answer is to c thank you uh, dr balasubramanian which is the most indicative viral <clears throat> Please go to the answer, uh, Jason. Uh, uh, see, basically, the concept that you must remember is that any cell count less than 10 in the CSF, unless it has been treated earlier very well, bacterial meningitis is very, very unlikely. And uh, in viral meningitis, the pressure is not greatly elevated. And the WBC count usually does not exceed more than 100 or few hundreds. And basically in uh, viral meningitis, you expect the glucose to be normal. You do not expect great elevation of protein. However, for every rule, there are exceptions. Even for this rule, there are good exceptions. Varicella meningitis, herpes simplex meningitis, mumps meningitis, even polio, non-polio, coxsackieviral meningitis, you may have occasionally low glucose levels. And the protein concentration in aseptic viral meningitis is not greatly elevated. But for a, for a clinician, if you find that your lab is reporting less than 10 cells per cubic millimeter and is reporting normal sugar and protein, bacterial meningitis, if the child has not received an antibiotic earlier, is not likely. In fact, one other diagnosis has to be considered when you get a high opening pressure along with moderate elevation of cells, that is neurosurgeon's brain abscess. It cannot be missed, should not be missed. If there are focal deficits, an imaging would pick up the diagnosis. Thank you. Next. Again, color matching, please go to the answer, uh, Jason. See, yellow CSF, xanthochromia, the yellow color is either due to bilirubin or due to blood breakdown product. It is not due to any other cause. And the commonest cause of xanthochromia is subarachnoid hemorrhage. 
and in neonates it may be yellow because of hyperbilirubinemia not in older children unless you do lumbar puncture in somebody who has got hepatic encephalopathy and uh, in subarachnoid hemorrhage you expect the proteins to be minimally elevated and you expect a lot of rbcs to the tune of 1 lakh per cubic millimeter rn csf could occur but i have not seen any rn csf so far in my practice in my career can occur when there is keratinemia and keratinemia may give a clue to the presence of hypothyroidism or it may indicate a chronic csf bleed which is more than 3 days old and of course very high csf protein for example you have uh, Uh, late stages of tuberculosis meningitis hydrocephalus you may get an rn csf because of high csf protein pink csf again could occur due to blood breakdown products often reason green again you can have if you have cholestatic jaundice with hyperbilirubinemia you can have a green csf and of course pseudomonas aeruginosa which can produce green color in the pus can also produce green color in the csf and when you get pseudomonas or burkhead area you always think of cystic fibrosis brown and i have not seen it can occur in meningeal melanomas a rare disorder coming to the csf findings of uh, uh, in various condition the there are there are certain points here mentioning that approximately csf 25% originates from extracorporeal sources that is true and if you look at the amount of production can you go to the next slide if you go to the amount amount of production what is important is that the total volume in an infant is 50 ml and in us in adults it's 150 this is a very important point to remember the reason why this learning point is necessary for the post graduates is that when they do lumbar puncture and there when there is no contraindication the child is stable you can take up to 5 ml csf even in an infant the reason is because the total volume of csf is 1/3 like in an adult even in a neonate it is quite high so do not have the fear of drawing lot of csf get as much as possible to do all the investigations including the new tech pcr and in fact if you don't have a definite diagnosis it is useful to preserve the csf for example there are children with acute febrile encephalopathy you may not have the diagnosis within a day or two ultimately you require csf for doing sophisticated tests for conditions such as autoimmune encephalitis and rare prion diseases and so many metabolic disorders causing encephalopathy so don't be scared to draw as much as possible particularly up to 5 ml in any age is extremely safe preserve the csf that is the learning point from this question coming to the diagnosis of diffuse cns infections we all know tuberculosis meningitis is notoriously uh, uh, well known for causing very high csf protein you can have xanthochromia so tb meningitis particularly in late stages the csf protein can go up to gram 1 gram per deciliter can be high and it may indicate uh, a need for neurosurgical intervention imaging and looking for complication of hydrocephalus next slide we already discussed this during our salmonella discussion t lymphocyte defects congenital or secondary to hiv or malignancy they are associated with the increased risk of listeria monocytogenesis this is very very important if a child is on chronic steroid therapy steroid therapy the child comes to you with meningitis you have to cover listeria in fact this is a very important point because in uh, young infants below the age of 3 months giving only cephalosporins is not rational for meningitis 
the reason is cephalosporins have very poor activity against listeria they don't do anything any good to the child so you have to add ampicillin or penicillin to some extent aminoglycate may be weakly effective so in infants and young children who are on steroid therapy they come to you with meningitis you have to cover listeria and of course you have to think of other infections which can occur in t cell defects including mycobacterium avium intracellulary which is notorious for causing right middle lobe syndrome particularly in hiv infected infants salmonella we already discussed and uh, pneumocystogirovisi toxoplasma cryptosporidium leishmania herpes simplex is notorious streptococcus histoplasma etc this should also include tuberculosis and the iv dexamethasone we discussed in uh, 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 detail it is not indicated in neonates so definitely not indicated below the age of 6 weeks questionable value below the age of 3 months and uh, it does a lot of good by reducing the risk of sensory neural hearing loss reducing the risk of, risk of subdural effusion reducing the risk of mortality studies have shown in adults and reduce probably reduce the risk of uh, other complications also and so iv dexamethasone is recommended strongly for h influenza type b only in infants and children more than 6 weeks of age with acute bacterial meningitis thank you dr bala balasubramanian Now I'll go to Matthew to about cochlear implants. Matthew, I will answer each one of them if you want. Yeah. Facial palsy is the the facial goes through the middle ear, so injury to that is possible though it's very rare. If we cut the facial nerve, one of the things is in children, very young children, you can have a abnormal facial nerve which is not recognized, and if you cut that, you are likely to have a permanent facial palsy. Transient vertigo, yes, you could result. Will you get a permanent uh, vertigo? Usually not, because there is a central compensation that is happening. Another thing that is happening is you have a electrode that is put in that goes. All of them should go into the cochlea. So, like the one that we did, there are some of them which are extra cochlear. And sometimes these are not opt. You can actually mechanically opt that one. So, if there is electrical current going through that, it can actually stimulate. the vestibular system also so every time the child hears a loud sound the child might get a dizziness but that can be corrected by offing it so um, transient dizziness yes you can get that post meningeal cochlear implantation 18 out of the 22 electrodes not necessary if you can get all the 22 electrodes very good but you should get a minimum of 12 to 14 electrodes uh yeah and uh, the results the restoration of auditory capacity of speech in post meningeal cochlear implantation is comparable to other indication yes i would say that uh, 12 to 14 is good enough for an adequate outcome hearing loss is sensory neural because it actually affects the inner ear so it's sensory neural ossification can start very early it can even start as early as 2 weeks post Hearing loss. It is said that can go on up to four years, not two years. Literature says up to four years, so you can actually get a late uh, uh, hearing loss in meningitis. MR T2 weighted images show fluid in the cochlea. That is a favorable sign. Shows that the cochlea is patent. Then you are able to put in nerve cell. And Barra is of course the gold standard for assessing post meningitis hearing loss. Yeah, meningitis can go up to even up four years post CNS. Uh, Insult. Thank you so much. I think uh, we come to today end of today evening session. Uh, I hope we all enjoyed it. Thank we must thank uh, our um, faculty and the delegates who participated. We are unfortunate that we didn't have enough PGs for the quiz. I required a request of the promote our. Uh, President of the IIP Kuching Basti proposal. Thank you, Jason sir, and uh, I thank all the speakers for the wonderful session. I know it's getting late, so I will wind up the session immediately. 
thank you and good night thank you thank you thank you so much dr bala thank you thank you thank you very much thank you my pleasure bye